Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy Fondo of Quick Mail Tayo. And this is Jack from Emails That Sell. So in this cast, you're going to learn what GDPR is from one of Europe's top compliance lawyers and what it means for your cold email strategy. You'll also find out how a single email could cost you up to 20 million euros starting on May 25th, 2018. And we'll go over much more in this 45-minute episode. It was cut down from an hour-long discussion, and since it's about GDPR, anything shorter would have missed something important. So take a listen. All right, so we're joined today by Jonathan Armstrong. He is an expert in the cold email legal field, and he's going to talk about GDPR, what it is, and what you need to know about it if you're sending cold emails from or to Europe. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me here. Yes, I'm Jonathan Armstrong. I'm based with Cordry. We're in London. I'm a lawyer, so I've done data protection stuff um, since the early 1990s. I'm also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, so I'm trying to look at these aspects from a marketing concept as well as from a legal background. And you can find out all sorts of things, FAQs on GDPR, glossaries, films, on our website at cordrycompliance.com. Cool. So Jonathan, we're here to talk about GDPR. Can we kick things off by just explaining exactly what that is? Yeah, GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a new privacy law that should apply somewhat consistently across the whole of the EU. And I'm saying should because the original plan was that the law would be uniform throughout the EU and that existing data protection law would be replaced by GDPR. But that's not really how it's panned out in practice. There's still the opportunity for local regulators to put their own stamp on GDPR and there's the opportunity for local parliaments, so national parliaments, to alter GDPR as well. So the UK government, for example, there's some legislation going through the UK Parliament at the moment that will be different from some of the other jurisdictions. So a great idea in some respects to have uniformity across Europe in privacy law, but it's not how it will work out in practice. Are they going to be more stringent? Is that, you know, the GDPR is going to be a base and on top of that, nation can make it stronger or can they make it more lenient? Yeah, they can't really make it more lenient. They can make it more stringent. And the UK proposals, for example, have some extra criminal offences that people doing email marketing could commit. So under the new UK draft law, for example, if you're given uh, anonymised data to mail to and you put an identity to that anonymized data, maybe by joining it up with some web stats that you've acquired to identify who the individual users are, that could be a criminal offense in the uh, UK proposals. So in most countries, their national laws are adding something on top of GDPR. And there's one other thing, of course, to remember, e-privacy laws are being updated at around about the same time. So there are already laws on things like marketing, the rough equivalent of can spam across Europe. They're domestic laws, so nation by nation laws at the moment, but under an EU framework. That law is being updated as well. It's behind schedule. There's still an aim to update that law by 25 May 2018. My guess is that deadline's going to slip, but we're in this real state of flux where for most campaigns, there are three or four legal regimes changing at around about the same time. Just taking one step back, so it's GDPR is basically uh, being issued or being created to protect people's privacy. If you're obtaining information about a company or an individual at that company, this law is meant to sort of put a lid on how much you can do when it comes to contacting that uh, entity, whether it's a person or a business. So far, is that sort of the right way to think about GDPR? 
Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're going to email to generic mailboxes like enquiries at uber.com, that isn't covered by GDPR. But nobody really wants to do email campaigns like that because they're generally not read. And as soon as you're going to add a name to that, Travis at uber.com, then that becomes personal data and that would be subject to GDPR. What ways can we send emails by complying with GDPR? For example, opt-in lists and that kind of thing. Yeah, you, you can build lists yourself and you can do that by making sure that you've got consent. Under GDPR, you want that consent to have more granularity to it. And in some respects, that's good marketing practice anywhere in Europe. I think people in Europe are less tolerant of email spam than in other jurisdictions. And so if you can get them to opt in to precisely what you're offering, then you, your success rate might be higher. So you've got to be clear in explaining people why you want their details and what you're going to do with them. So that's for stuff you're acquiring yourself. And if you're going to buy in a list or get it through a third party, then you've got to make sure that they've got the right consent, not only to take that data and to process it, but also to pass it on to you. So in some respects, you can still run uh, email marketing campaigns, but you've got to do more due diligence and you've got to satisfy yourself of the quality of the consent that was obtained. Consent isn't the only way you can legitimize email marketing. You can have various other ways of making a campaign lawful, but they're going to be increasingly hard, as I say, in part because of this relationship between the email marketing rules, which in the UK at the moment we call PICA. So the PICA rules and GDPR and, and some disconnects between those two different regimes. Can you make the difference between implicit and explicit? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of people in the past have relied on implied consent. So they've said, for example, because this guy has asked me to say, send him something, he must be consenting to it. Let's say I'm looking online for a new office chair. You might say, oh, because he's asked for a brochure, he's given me implied consent to follow up and to target him. Under GDPR, we're concentrating much more on implicit consent and what's called full and informed consent to say to people, do you want a brochure on the chair? Do you want me to follow up? Do you want me to do both? Do you want a short film on chairs? You know, you've got to get more granular in what your offer is and get people to physically tick I accept rather than the opt out mechanism of saying, no, don't send me it. What about when it comes to the content in the email itself? So for example, if we're writing emails that try and sell a product or a service, maybe that's one thing. But is it a little bit different if, let's say, you're writing an email to network with somebody or maybe to share an introduction? Let's take an example, Jonathan, if I wanted to find a, a good lawyer in the UK and somebody uh, said, oh, you need to talk to Jonathan Armstrong. If I looked up your info and said, hey, you know, James told me to reach out to you because you're a great lawyer, would that be consistent with GDPR? That's a great question, actually, because I think Jack called email you, Jonathan. So does that mean yeah, that? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> What's the consequences then after GDPR? Does he go in jail? As far as I know, he wasn't marketing anything. And I, but I think that's a great question. This is an issue in a case in the UK. As you probably know, as I've said, this PICA regime already exists. In the UK, the same regulator regulates the Data Protection Act that's going to be replaced with GDPR and the current PICA regime. And a lot of people have done marketing campaigns that are sort of marketing campaigns and sort of not. And in some of the cases, one, for example, in, involves an airline. The airline did a campaign to try and get people to opt in so that they could market to them after GDPR. Now, they tried to incentivize a response by a promotion to possibly get a free trip on the airline. And the regulator decided that made it a marketing email because they'd incentivize the opt-in. So 
it doesn't have to be a conventional come and buy our stuff it's great to be a marketing email and people are going to have to look much more closely at the content of their mailings so things like incentivized opt-ins uh, are pretty dangerous things like saying hey we haven't seen you for a while we want you back as a customer come back and visit our site we've got 20 percent discount we've got some great stuff for you stuff that you might have conventionally thought was good crm or keeping in contact could be viewed as marketing by regulators so of course reaching out to somebody to say i'm buying usually isn't marketing but anything that suggests that you're selling probably is. That's a great question. So, you know, the email that you received that said, hey, you know, we'd like to invite you to our podcast, that's okay. There's nothing being sold or marketed right then and there, correct? Yeah, sure. Again, the difficulty is going to be that we've now got 30, 35 different regulators across Europe, each with their own interpretation of what those rules are. Do you think this would be legal in most countries in Europe if we said something like, you know, Hey, Joe, since you're using uh, this software to run your business, I I'm just really curious, are, are you happy with it? Feel free to let me know by replying to this email. Sometimes people start, quote unquote, sales conversations that way. Uh, I'm just wondering if that's too aggressive to be legal now. I think regulators are going to look at intent. You know, regulators have got all sorts of wider powers to ask questions to, in worst case scenario, do dawn raids to seize equipment. So if that does attract attention, I think they're going to be asking questions about, you know, what was the end game? We can see what the first email was, but where was that going? And bear in mind that some of these investigations are started with only one complaint. We've got cases where the mailing was to about three and a half million people one of those individuals complained, and that still triggers an investigation. So a lot of this stuff is challenging. Obviously, if it's genuine relationship building, like email equivalent of LinkedIn type connections, yeah, I think we've got something in common, can we chat? Then that's less likely to attract regulators' attention than you know the sort of campaign that regulators don't like, where people say, can you fill in a questionnaire? then they're using the questionnaire to sell people on the back of the responses that they've made. So I think regulators would say in most cases, whether or not that's a marketing email, you've not fairly disclosed the purpose of your content. And bear in mind the fact that under GDPR, even if it's not a marketing email, if it's not regarded as fair, it still falls foul of GDPR. Not regarded as fair. What do you mean by that? So data controllers, so those organizations that have got data and are under an obligation to use data fairly under GDPR. And regulators can interpret that pretty widely. So if you're holding data for one purpose and using it for another, you've probably breached one of the principles of GDPR and it's open to a regulator to take action against you because of that. Does that mean that cold email as a whole is just becoming illegal under GDPR then? I don't think it becomes illegal, but I think that you probably have to go through more checks and balances than you used to. In most cases, I think to run a large-ish campaign, people will want to go through what's called a data protection impact assessment. So this is a process for checking the privacy risk behind something that you're doing. So let's say you're going to acquire a mailing list and you're going to mail out to people as part of a big campaign. You'd want to do a DPIA first. And that DPIA will be a process where you're going to look at, you know, what could the risk be? Well, the risk could be that the guy who's selling me the list isn't uh, up front with me. He's stolen the list from a firm he used to work for. And then you've got to look at ways in which you can mitigate that risk. Well, I might mitigate that risk by checking the guy is who he says he is, by getting some sort of contract in place to assure me that the list is legit, etc., etc. So you've got to go through this process of looking at what the risk is and how you're going to reduce that risk. Let's say someone is, buying, is selling me a list. 
does that mean that I have to make sure that he got consent from the people on his list uh, that they're okay to receive sort of marketing emails? He gave that to me and then he transferred the rights of the consent over to me. Is that something even feasible under GDPR? Yeah, he's got to have got consent to you using the list. And you've got to be able to evidence that fact if a regulator asks for it. So you would want to have a contract in place with the guy who's selling you the list, which says, yep, I promise you there's 100,000 on this list. All of them have agreed to get the type of mailing that you're going to send. Let's say you have a mailing list, Jonathan. And then Jack is subscribing to your mailing list saying, yes, I'm happy to receive email from Jonathan. Then suddenly you can go to me and then sell me that list and I can get to email Jack. Yeah, so so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get consent, in, in this case, from the individual to third-party marketing. And that consent is more likely to be valid the more detailed you are. So in some of the cases that we've had already, wording like we want to send marketing email to you from us and from our selected marketing partners isn't great but let's say for example i'm the french open tennis i want you to opt into my mail list and i say uh, and we're sponsored by laurent perrier champagne we're sponsored by renault and we're sponsored by tiffany jewelers and all three of those would like to be in touch with you as well. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I got it. So it's basically a tick box that I make sure I tick every time that says, do you agree third party to contact you? Yeah, exactly that. And, and you're trying to get the consent as good as you can get it. And in some respects, that's good marketing practice as well, because you might get less numbers, but you'll get people who are keener to hear what you've got to say. So I understand this is in the marketing world. Uh, we are more into this sort of like sales world when we are doing like cold email. We're reaching out. We are business. We are trying to make money, obviously, uh, because that's the sole purpose of a business. How we are going to get new clients on, on the outbound side. So inbound being someone comes to my website, is interested, he wants to contact me. But if no one knows about me, especially if I'm a startup or a small, small shop business, I need to go out and then find those customers. So let's say, for example, I figured out that your company is a great fit for what I have to offer. How on earth am I going to then contact you if, you know, if, that's, if you're a European company? I think that does become challenging under the new regime. I think the safe way of doing it is to go generic rather than specific. But I know that from a sales point of view, that's not going to get you results in most cases. So I think people are going to be looking at innovative ways of trying to do it, for example, by trying to develop relationships in other ways through intermediaries. The cold sales environment, I think, does become more challenging. And it depends who you talk to about how difficult that is and how aggressive different regulators are going to be. I guess the only thing we do know is that people are less likely to complain about a connection that they think is mutually valuable and they're more likely to complain against the sort of, you know, robo data type attitude. But you know what I mean in terms of people having a long list and going through them with no value. We all receive real spams. <laughs> I think a lot of this is going to be about quality rather than quantity. So, I mean, I give you an example. I've had a lot of experience with headhunters. You know, I've had a headhunter who rang me up to say, we hear that you're the best environmental real estate lawyer in the UK. And I say, I've never done environmental real estate work, full stop. <laughs> and the guy says to me, come on, you're just being modest. <laughs> Sing your own phrases. Right? <laughs> no. Now, that's an amusing call, but it puts the phone <laughs> oh, down God. on me. But I put the phone down. Equally, I've had headhunters who say, can you give me 30 seconds? If you're not interested after 30 seconds, put the phone down on me. They've given me a 25-second pitch. It's been really good. The end of the 25-second pitch is, I'd love to have five minutes to tell you more. Yes or no? You say yes. 
five minutes, they finish on four minutes 30. That's the way, I think, to build, you know, a relationship, whatever you're selling, whether you're trying to sell somebody into a new job, you've got to be respectful with people's time. They're less likely to complain, I think, as a result. That's pretty interesting because I think that initial pitch is exactly what we focus on if you're sending a cold email campaign because, you know, hey, click here to buy just doesn't work. So I'm hearing and I just want to make sure this is the message. Do we need to take the conversation back a couple steps before the actual quote unquote selling begins? So in other words, don't fire off a batch of emails that ask people to fill out a form or to, to have a demo with your stuff. Instead, maybe take a few steps back and just find out if they're doing a certain activity that might make them a good fit for the company. Maybe take a step back and try and introduce yourself and maybe schedule an in-person meeting just to sort of network. Maybe it's just ask a few questions about the company and be very upfront with what you're doing. So for example, Jim, I see that you have a landscaping company. I'm an entrepreneur looking to create a tool to help landscapers like yourself. I have a couple questions about your business. If you're okay with uh, jumping on a call, just hit reply. Otherwise, thanks for reading. P.S. You know, full disclosure, I would love to learn more so that I could deliver a great product for you guys. Would that be somewhere in the right direction? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's right. We're sometimes in the same situation that we get client A will say, actually, I was talking to a guy who said he'd be interested in the sort of stuff you're doing around GDPR for us. Can you mail him some stuff? Well, because we haven't got a direct consent, you know, we're saying, Jack said you'd be interested in getting this. Here's some FAQs on the type of things that we think are issues in GDPR. If you want to know more, let me know. It probably just boils down to, does this person want to receive that mail that you just sent them? Did they just read it and get upset enough to go file a complaint with the GDPR folks? Yeah, I think that's right. And bear in mind the fact that there are people in Europe who think they can make money out of receiving spam email and running along to regulators and then asking for cash. There's not a lot of people like that around, but there are some who just believe that you know, the receipt of a spam email furthers their home-based business of suing marketers. That's, uh, that's comforting. I'm going to sleep really great tonight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, talking about fines, there's a lot of confusion about, I think it's 4% of the global annual revenue or yeah. 2 millions. Am I correct with the numbers? 20, 20 million 20 euros. million, yeah. And I read the GDPR, and I think it says or. One or the other, whichever is the greatest. And on yes. the internet, you find, you know, it's going to be 4% of your revenue. And then 4% of my revenue as a small company is not that big a deal, but 20 million is, you know, I'm out of business. So what's the reality here? Yeah, you're, you're right that it's complicating, and you're right that there's a lot of bad information out on the internet. We made a, a short film called GDPR Fake News. We're going to link it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, do. My colleague's a big fan of Penn and Teller, so he uh, thought it was a great idea to try and explain GDPR Fake News in part through the world of mime. So you'll guess how successful it is when you watch the film. <laughs> but... um. But one of the big lies that we see is it's 4% of profit. It isn't. You know, we've had clients that said, we haven't made a profit for four years, so we're pretty relaxed about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> License to send code email yeah. for free. The easiest way of looking at it is if you're small, the maximum potential fine is 20 million euros. If you're a larger business, <laughs> then nice. it's 4% of your global annual revenue, obviously, if that figure is higher than 20 million euros. But for most of the people who are doing marketing campaigns, 20 million euros is the number to concentrate on. Now, will the fines get as high as that? Probably not. In the UK, the fines under PICA, you know, are at all sorts of levels. The fine that we talked about for the airline trying to generate opt-in ends up around about the $100,000 level. I would expect fines for marketing campaigns not to increase hugely above current levels, 
So I'd be surprised if an isolated marketing campaign got to a fine of above one to two million euros. But obviously that's still what we would call a good night Vienna moment for most houses. You know, there's little difference between a two million euro fine and a 20 million euro fine because they're both fatal. What's the formula to figure out how much somebody should get fined? You know, is it how many people were on that campaign? How salesy was the content? It's a super complicated formula, actually. It's, it's harder than you would think. We've done a piece on fine calculation for a client to try and show how to calculate a fine for different eventualities. And that table is probably about a dozen pages long in terms of the aspects of the equation. So to simplify it, different bits of GDPR have different penalties. So it isn't 4% above the board, some are 2%, for example. That's one bit of the equation. Which category of fine does it sit in? Then the second thing that you're looking at is what's called aggravating factors. What makes the fine worse? And there's a list of ag aggravating factors and again, country by country. So there's a suggested list, if you like, that regulators have to take into account, but they can take other stuff into account as well. So one of those might be refusing to cooperate with a regulator, uh, not making any effort to sign up a contract with the people you acquired the list from. And then at the other end of the scale, there are what are called mitigating factors. So good things you did. So, for example, reaching out to a regulator, telling the regulator you'd messed up and self-disclosing the issue, cooperating with a regulator, um, making sure that there was no harm to victims by, I don't know, offering some compensation. Or So the equation gets quite complicated. And bear in mind the fact that one email campaign could theoretically breach different bits of GDPR. So let's say, for example, you mail somebody in an unfair way with data that you shouldn't have acquired, that you acquired from somebody without having a written agreement in place, and that data was out of date, then you've committed four separate offences under GDPR, which could be at different filing levels. Okay, I have a ton of questions about uh, obtaining data. Let's say, Jonathan, that you know I, I check out your business page and I see that you're using WordPress to uh, set up your website. I mean, is that data that I can talk about because it's kind of there in your source code that's technically out in the public? I personally wouldn't have too much trouble with that, I think. The fact that you're using a particular type of software, in most cases, it would be that the corporation is using the software rather than the individual. So you'd question whether that was personal data at all. You know, let's say I'm a WordPress administrator, then that's personal data. But I think it's on that borderline between personal data and not. Okay, so company data is obtainable, kind of go crazy with it, just limit yourself on the personal stuff. Is that right? Yeah, as a general rule... If you're taking stuff like attributes of the corporation rather than the individual, then that's likely to be less worrying. Is it that using a company that enrich personal data, as in, you know, his title at work, if I use a company that provides me those data and I use that into a campaign that makes that breaks the GDPR? Well, y yes and no. Sometimes enrichment can be a good thing. Because under GDPR, you have an obligation to make sure the data is accurate and it's up to date. So checking against... <laughs> what? Yeah. So, yes. so you, there could be a case where matching your data with someone else's data, provided that you're doing that lawfully, is a good thing and helps you to comply with GDPR. So it's... Not necessarily the case that combining two data sets is bad. Bear in mind the fact that there is concern, particularly around the online advertising industry, about matching data sets, which is why we're potentially getting these new criminal provisions in the UK legislation.
if an employee takes some time out of their day and fills out their LinkedIn profile and clicks the, you know, save, make as public button, and they've just uploaded their information to LinkedIn, that's a public website. Is that consent? Is that information that I'm allowed to know about? Yeah, just because it's been made public doesn't mean that it isn't personal data. And this has been the subject of one of my favorite cases of 2017. Basically, this whole thing is a dispute over corporation that provide tow bars to tow caravans and a guy who reckons that he's got a better way of towing caravans And his argument is basically that I could use the data relating to the executives of the other business because they'd put it into the public domain by filling out LinkedIn profiles, etc. And the court have effectively said that that isn't the case. So for those tech geeks, the case is called Alco Coba. I just think insofar as court cases are ever amusing, so basically, you're saying that, you know, I can't necessarily use the data because it's public. The bad guy in this case, his defense was that he got the data off uh, LinkedIn and social media and that he had what he called a public domain defense. The data is already in the public domain and therefore I'm entitled to use it. And the court said there is no such defense. It doesn't doesn't exist. In this case, the manager had told the individual to stop using his data and the court said the the use of his data was beyond what was expected and that was quote an unwarranted use of his data so it seems like basically the law is extremely stringent and we're relying on what the recipient judge is a spam or not i think that's right i think if you upset recipients then you're more likely to face consequences i think what about data processors? So, for example, QuickMail. So, I'm the owner of QuickMail. It's a tool that helps people to do cold email. So, they plan their campaign, they have their list, and they plan, they craft their message. Hopefully, they cater their list properly. And then they initiate some automation email behind it. What are the risks that are involved by data processors? The primary responsibility on a campaign is always going to be on the data controller. But data processors can have some consequences. There's quite a a long list of things that could be an issue for, for a data processor. A data regulator can, for example, send a questionnaire to a data processor asking how it handled data. In extreme cases, it can go along to the data processor's premises. Let's say yours is a cloud service and you maintain the server, they might be able to go along and look at the server and see what it's doing. In some cases, data subjects can bring litigation against the data processor directly. The data processor would have the right to get money from the data controller if they had to pay damages and it was the data controller's fault, but the data controller might have gone into liquidation, for example, so the data processor could be left holding that. So there are quite a lot of obligations on data processors that don't exist under the existing law. And a data processor's life does get tougher under GDPR than it is currently. Maybe cold email is a bit gray area, for example, but what about marketing tools? Like, you know, you can upload a list, say, tick a box like, yeah, obtain their consent. And then in fact, it's not the case. One person gets upset, then sue the the data provider, processor and the data controller, then then what happens? Does the software that was just scheduling emails and then sending emails, I mean, to some extent, we could even say Gmail, you know, if I actually send an email to someone that gets upset, it's a cold email, then can they actually sue Gmail for sending that email? Or can they sue this marketing automation tool? Yeah, for in most that cases, a consumer has the right to sue either Uh, And then there has to be a sort of attribution behind the scenes. So the consumer gets his damages and then there would theoretically be 
a second piece of litigation between the processor and the controller working out the fair proportion. Let's say you did something bad, you had to pay me a thousand dollars, then there might be some second litigation where you say, hang on, I've just paid a thousand dollars out to Armstrong, but 80% of the fault was with the data controller because they didn't put in the right data and so they should pay $800 and I should only left, be left with 200 So there can be this attribution, if you like, of damages after the data subject's been paid out. But again, they're very much the complicated bits of, of GDPR towards the end of GDPR that not many people have got to yet. But there's all sorts of potential traps for data processes as well in GDPR. And that's why we're seeing the start of this almost war of contracts between data processors and data controllers. We're already seeing data processors say things like, if you're going to use our software, then you have to give us a guarantee that you're going to use it lawfully. And if you breach your guarantee, then you're going to pay us 20 million euros or or whatever that clause is saying and in some respects that's a bit awkward isn't it you know if I buy an automobile and I go into the showroom the, the showroom doesn't say do you know what you could kill someone with this car you could drive over the speed limit you could do all sorts of bad things. So before I will let you drive this car away, you have to go through some training with me. You have to, you you have to, you know, give me a guarantee for twenty million dollars in case you hit someone. Yeah, you're you're laughing, but I think I guess that's exactly what would happen if suddenly the law decide that if you kill someone with an Audi, then Audi needs to pay. Yeah, and that maybe maybe that is where we're headed. It's almost funny to think Audi being responsible for somebody getting a crash just for driving their car. I, I'm wondering, why was GDPR drawn up in the first place? Was it mostly to protect a consumer against getting a mass email campaign that's reaching millions of people? Or is it something a little bit more down to earth? Yeah, I think that's a large amount of the motivation, to be honest. There are all sorts of dreams that some European politicians had, one of which I think was that if life was made tough for US-based technology companies, a brilliant Luxembourgese native would rise from the woods, um, put on his magic cloak (laughs) and become the next Zuckerberg. If only the law helped him, you know, find (laughs) his mojo. So, So I think there were these dreams of a greater European dawn and how the US somehow dominated the technology scene through the legal world being bent in their favour. And I I didn't really think that chimed with reality, nor did I think that um, a lot of the law was well thought through. You know, there's all sorts of odd aspects to GDPR. You know, they a criticism that the existing law was out of date when GDPR already looks pretty tired, you know, in, in, in certain areas, it does look out of date already. It's not even in force yet. What we've got to learn, I think, is that technology law should be principles based, not specific. And and whilst ever we try and make them super specific, they, are, they get out of date very quickly. So you worry about GDPR is we're trying to use old world techniques to cope with new world technologies and 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 that's part of the many issues with GDPR. Yeah, does that mean that a lot of um, European clients will just simply, you know, stop emailing European people and just, you know, focus back on, on US? I think some people are looking at different markets. I think the extraterritorial bits of GDPR will be interesting how they play out. In some respects, US corporations mailing into the EU are disadvantaged versus a EU-based entity doing the same because of what's called the DPR provisions. So if a non-EU-based business is doing stuff that makes it come within GDPR, like trying to 
uh, sell in the EU, profiling EU citizens, etc., etc. It has to appoint a data protection representative. So somebody who will effectively guarantee their performance of GDPR, who's based within the EU. And I, I know that many corporations are struggling to get somebody who will be their DPR or struggling to get anyone who will be it for a realistic cost. Uh, and again, that gets back to the 20 million euro. If I'm in the EU and you want me to be the DPR, I'm going to say, you're going to need to make it worth my while. And you say, well, what to make it worth my while? Well, I'm on the hook for 20 million euros. You could commit to two breaches a year. So I want 40 million <laughs> euros. Um, you might say, my business can't sustain 40 million euros. Are you a crazy man? And I'll say... Mm, I don't need a DPR, you do. So I think we're getting that yeah. type of discussion already. <laughs> I hear a rumour that there's one business, for example, that just literally cannot get a DPR. So it may have to stop business in Europe altogether. And does this apply only to email, Jonathan? Or does this go for you know sending a direct message on Instagram to somebody or sending... A LinkedIn connection or a LinkedIn message or maybe a, a tweet or something like other another channel? Yeah, GDPR is very broad. So anything that's processing would come within GDPR. And basically anything you can think of to do with data is normally processing. But uh, in the case of Instagram, I mean, people give consent to receive, you know, communication from Instagram. It's the same for LinkedIn. I give consent to receive email from LinkedIn. Can we piggyback on this consent? Possibly. It depends on the consent that LinkedIn have got. So what I think we're going to see is more granularity from service providers and more clarity. And I think if you're a social media operator, for example, you've got to look at your core demographics. If you're Instagram, then by the nature of the fact that you're Instagram, you know that probably most of your users are into pictures rather than words. So I think what we're going to see is companies that are really great at this look at how to communicate messages. Then they'll have more robust consents on the back of it. So, for example, we've had a UK TV channel that got consents by having one of the anchors from the channel make a film about why they wanted consent. And I think that can even work for the likes of Instagram. If they say, look, we want to make Instagram free still. We want to make it accessible to people. We know that a lot of you like using Instagram. Here's the trade-off. The trade-off is that we're going to take data and we're going to do this with it. If you're explaining that to people, then you like to have less issues. And if Instagram can get that consent to monetize that data by passing it on to you, then your consent's more valid and you're less likely to have trouble with GDPR. So for most businesses, it's not like the day of death. It's not the day that marketing dies. Looking at it positively, I've said I'm no great fan of GDPR. It's here. We've got to use this as an opportunity to reevaluate what we do, to be more engaging with the people we're trying to sell to, and to use this as an opportunity to improve the quality of our campaigns. And do you know what? If we do that, and if we get it right, and if we listen to people, they'll buy more of our stuff anyway. Yeah, that that's definitely true. Um, but at the same time... Uh, and not to get on too much of a rant, but I do sort of feel for, you know, my brothers and sisters in Europe who are trying to start their business and just, you know, are are facing either a huge marketing expense to go after a different kind of paid channel uh, because they can no longer just have one-to-one -one conversations with their potential customers that they would need to do uh, research on their product to have customer interviews to find out how to make it better to, you know, get their first hundred customers. I mean, that conversation now has just become 
greatly more expensive and, and greatly more risky, almost to a point where that's no longer an option if you know you're trying to start a business in Europe. And you know, I, I hope that that spirit of entrepreneurship isn't affected after this passes. Yeah, I, I think that's again where you would have hoped that GDPR would have been better thought through. But as I say, it's not all negative. To give you just one quick example, we've got one client and they have presences at trade shows and they are obviously worried about GDPR. And in the past, what they've done at trade shows is they've used those uh, laser guns to scan people's barcodes. And then they've mailed the hell out of those lists when they've got back to base. And all the people on the stand have been told to do is laser as many people as you can. They remunerated people on the stand on the basis of how many badges they zapped. And do you know what? They found the quality of that list wasn't great. Uh, they're worried about that from GDPR. They're worried about whether that was a consent or not. So they experimented with, instead of that, having an iPad on the stand saying, are you interested in this product line? Are you interested in this product line? And so they had more of a consultative approach on the stand. And the commonest reaction is, we didn't know you guys did that. Tell me more about it, because that's actually what I'm at this show looking for. Obviously, the quantity of their leads has reduced, but the quality has increased. But what that's meant is that sales have increased, because sometimes having... 20,000 people on a database who don't open your emails isn't as good as having 100 people on the database who buy from you. Do you think it's going to be like cookies disclaimer on websites? Like, you know, those banner that says, hey, click UK and no one really pay attention to. Do you think it's going to be the same as GDPR? All it will require is, you know, one user complaining kind of thing. Yeah, I think the ability of people to potentially make money out of infringement is slightly different versus cookie laws. I agree with you in some respects that bits of it are as pointless as the cookies laws. I know that there's an interesting correlation between as the law gets tougher, the number of complaints that the regulators receive drops. In part, I think, because people are more annoyed by the box they have to click through than they are by cookies. I think the elements of GDPR will be like that. Yeah, people will become annoyed by, I want that brochure on, I don't know, office furniture. I don't want to fill in a form that takes 10 minutes for me to get the office furniture brochure. So I think a lot of organizations are going to have to take a really pragmatic approach to how they're going to do this. How many companies are ready, in your views, as like, is 100%... 80%, just 10% of companies are ready for GDPR, none. What's your view on that? Closer to none than 100. We have done an exercise with um, an online GDPR assessment tool so that people could self-assess where they thought they were. The average corporation thinks it's about 35% of where it needs to be to comply with GDPR. If you're a European company, you know, obviously we can't, send unsolicited, unopt-in kind of messages for the most part within Europe. That also applies if you're sending it to the US? No. You can basically send what you like to the US. GDPR won't apply to that communication to the US. GDPR is there to protect EU citizens. You know what? I think it'll just be a, a bit of a game of, of watch, listen, and learn as, uh, you know, the rollout date comes through and, you know, I'm sure case cases will start popping up that we can all just sort of stay educated and up to date on how it's being enforced and how it's changing. Oh, I'm sorry you had to listen to 45 minutes to discover that basically any call email with the intent to sell that is sent to your EU citizen without clear explicit consent from that person will be deemed illegal under GDPR. So, if you want to never break the law, you probably should refrain from cold emailing people in Europe. Might be a good opportunity to explore a bit more your inbound strategies here. And for those who need to contact uh, people within the EU, and make sure you have an explicit content from your prospect first, and that you're comfortable with the legal risks involved. 
Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. Or Stitcher or TuneIn. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks.